129 VTR number H90 stroke 190 stroke A, 12th of February 74 TBA. Repeat firing line, Mr. John Hume, program number S129. Last April, uh, William Whitelaw, in behalf of uh, Westminster in London, filed the long-awaited recommendations on how to proceed with the crisis in North Ireland. Uh, a year earlier, the Stormark, the Legislative Assembly of North Ireland, uh, had been suspended, and in the interval, there was ruled directly from London. The Whitelaw uh, Report, the White Paper, as it is called, uh, returned a, a degree of home rule to uh, Ulster, specifying, however, that the Catholic minority had to be substantially represented in the executive branch as well as in the legislative branch. There were uh, elections last June, and the results were ambiguous. On the one hand, the moderate unionists got the largest number of votes, but the uh, opposition uh, opposed to cooperation under any circumstances with the Catholic uh, minority did get heavy representation at the Catholic end, the Social uh, Democratic and Labor Party won 19 seats out of the total of 78. The deputy leader of that party, John Hume, was named Minister of Commerce. John Hume was born and educated in Londonderry, or in Derry, as you prefer, and went on to the National University of Ireland he then taught school for 10 years before being elected to Parliament in 1969 as an independent member. Uh, in protest against <coughs> British interventions and general terrorism, he pulled out of the Stormont and sounded for a period as though he was irrevocably opposed to proceeding within the system. He accordingly surprised many of his friends and much of his constituency when he decided to cooperate with the recommendations of the White Paper. As things stand now, there is not even an uneasy truce. Business does get done, and the juridical safeguards are neatly in place. But violence continues. I should like to begin by asking Mr. Hume whether he now believes that London was correct in taking over the government of his country in 1972. Well, before I answer that question, I would like to correct a couple of your assumptions. The first one being that some of my friends and many of my constituents were surprised that I should uh, become involved in the present system of government in Northern Ireland. In the first place, uh, as your introduction implies, this, it's an entirely different system of government, whereas in uh, the original system of government was one party rule, and that one party rule was the root of what eventually became the Troubles. Uh, <coughs> what we have now is a system of partnership in which the different traditions in Northern Ireland in partnership uh, administer the affairs of Northern Ireland in the social and economic field, while at the moment Westminster retains control over law and order. You asked me whether Britain were wise to intervene. This was the question you asked in 1972. And of course, I think there's no one would uh, deny that they had no alternative but to intervene because the situation had completely broken down uh, when uh, uh, Britain, uh, in fact, uh, took over, because Stormont, as it then was, had ceased to be uh, and, and did not have the consent of, the, of a substantial section of the community, and no system of government can continue if it has a withdrawal of consent from a substantial section of the community. Well, do you, do you feel that um, the, the English were then uh, overdue? 
in uh, intervening, or do you feel that it was proper to wait until that moment in order to satisfy the majority of the people that there was, in fact, no alternative? Well, uh, the trouble with, with, with Britain was that uh, they had turned a blind eye to what had been happening in Northern Ireland for the previous 50 years. And, uh, in fact, uh, problems relating to Northern Ireland were not allowed to be raised in the British Parliament. Uh, and, of course, uh, when eventually uh, people lost patience with uh, normal parliamentary processes and uh, took to street protest instead, uh, then the writing was on the wall and Britain eventually had to intervene because, as I say, uh, there was a complete withdrawal of consent uh, by a substantial section of the population from the existing institutions. And once that happened, <coughs> those institutions were no longer capable of providing stable government. And uh, there was only one alternative, that Britain, who retained respo ultimate responsibility for the situation in the North, had to intervene and had to seek alternative ways of finding a system of government. That those alternative ways, in my opinion, have been found and represent the best way forward uh, for the people of Ireland at the present time. Now, when, when, you say that, um, when you say that a government that does not represent all of the people is an unviable uh, government, aren't you saying that this is so when the differences between the majority and the minority are as irreconcilable as they are in your in your country. Mm -hmm. in, my, in my country, this happens quite regularly, that uh, the executive takes all. Yeah, but what I am really saying is that democracy really doesn't simply mean majority rule. It means majority rule with the consent of the population, and uh, consent of a substantial uh, section was withdrawn. And this is particularly so uh, whenever that majority is deliberately created, as the Northern Ireland majority was, because by drawing a line across the map of Ireland, uh, 50, 50 odd years ago, uh, a majority was deliberately created and a minority was deliberately created. And that minority was permanently alienated from the system of government and uh, remained so for a period of over 50 years. And therefore, uh, you know, what happened did happen because, in effect, that minority withdrew its consent completely. Uh, its consent up to then could hardly have been described as a total consent or total commitment. But I think that what we have now is a system of government <coughs> to which uh, both sections of the community are committed, although there are elements on both sides that at the moment are not committed. Well, I don't think um, many people would, would deny, I, I, I certainly wouldn't, that uh, during that period of 50 years, there was uh, a very considerable opportunizing at the expense of the minority by mm -hmm. the majority. But in fact, uh, the society did survive. 50 years <coughs> is, is a long time. It wasn't yes. 1968. Mm -hmm. that the minority became uh, fractious and said that it wasn't going to, uh, to uh, tolerate existing divisions of, uh, of power. Now, if something can last between 1921 and 1968, why can't it last out the balance of the century? Or is it that the Catholic <laughs> minority in your country was experiencing something there that was a, a, a part of that uh, uh, emancipatory zeitgeist well, I think of the there, century. I, I think there, there are several points there. First of all, I think one has to look at the, the reasons which all came together at that point in time. And one has to look at the fact, too, that I think that the, the educational system, uh, which did um, w was considerably improved uh, in 1947, did in fact start to uh, produce a tremendous number of Catholics who were educated and uh, in fact took a harder and colder look at the, the situation. But uh, what an awful lot of points came together at that point of time, which literally created, uh, built the, the, the power. And uh, the power was made up literally of, of a, a series of injustices. We had, the, of course, the, the, uh, the electoral system, particularly at local level, um, where, where we didn't have one man, one vote, and where minorities were able to rule by systems of gerrymander and peculiar voting systems. Uh, we had uh, then uh, housing manipulated to maintain uh, political power, uh, th thereby creating very serious social problems and, uh, in areas where, where, you know, very like my own city of Derry, where the problem really, where the protests really began in '68, uh, where people were seriously deprived in the housing field. You had then economic discrimination against whole areas where, you know, uh, you, have, you had cities like Derry, 
like Straban, like Newry, uh, in areas like South of Mile, West Belfast, uh, where the male unemployment figure never went below 12 percent, and other areas in Northern Ireland where it sat around three and four. Well, it, was this an accident or was it not? Added to that, you had heavy discrimination, or not discrimination, but emigration from these same areas. Now, all of these factors uh, literally coalesced at the one time, following a new, in my opinion, at least this is my interpretation of what happened, at the beginning of the 60s, the then Unionist government developed a new um, um, economic plan, uh, which um, was generally regarded by the minority as a, a new plantation of Ulster, in a sense, and it was concentrating all development east of the River Ban. This involved uh, the question of the siting of a new university. It involved the question of a creation of a new second city, thereby making it clear that the existing second city was not going to get priority in development, although it had existing people and existing unemployment. Uh, we had the cutting of the railways to the western part of Northern Ireland. Uh, we had all these things come together, and these coalesced at the same time with a particularly difficult problem in the city of Derry, where uh, the housing problem had reached a, a real pitch of seriousness and where in order to resolve it, either houses had to be built in other electoral districts or the city boundary had to extend, either of which would have meant a loss of power to the existing uh, party in power, the Unionist Party, and they refused to do so. The pressure simply built up and uh, people went to the streets to, to protest and uh, were met with a uh, police force, and the, the batons uh, were the spark mm. that lit, lit the pyre, so to speak. Now, it, it's, it's uh, interesting to me that um in, in the last uh, five or ten minutes, both of us have discussed uh, the question without really uh, any reference at all to the re religious aspect uh, uh, of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, have, I have noticed in visits here and visits uh, there that the term Protestant uh, seems to be coextensive with the term uh, English mm -hmm. rather than with a, a, an extra Catholic uh, religion. On the other hand, I, I've heard it said here uh, today that the activities of the Catholic Church in South Island considerably uh, exacerbate tensions, and that under the circumstances, uh, unification is, uh, is drastically retarded mm -hmm. as a result of the prospect of uh, Northern Protestants submitting to what they call Rome rule. Is that exaggerated, or is that a genuine fear? Well, uh, the fear is consistently expressed by the Protestant majority in the North, which is a Protestant minority in Ireland, that uh, in fact that by coming into a united country they would be subjected to what they call a Rome rule. That fear is consistently expressed. I don't personally believe that if all the, the changes that, that they asked for took place tomorrow that that would advance the, their wish for Irish unity one iota. Uh, I do think that the, the, the creation of the border uh, uh, and the division of the country into literally a, pro a Protestant state and a Catholic state institutionalized the division between Catholic and Protestant in Ireland and that each went its own way, so to speak, and that rather than the sort of uh, development that would have taken place by the, by the both communities living in, in the one state and by the interrelation and interaction uh, of one on the other, that the differences would have been bound to have softened, instead that they became heightened. And we have, in a sense, uh, the religious views of the majority in both parts of Ireland does to some extent dominate the laws in both parts of Ireland. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the marriage laws in, in the Republic are clearly uh, dominated uh, by, by Catholic thinking, and uh, as, as is uh, you know, uh, normal in, 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 I think, any country, I think one of the, the points of dispute here about marriage laws and divorce laws that people, I think, ignore is that it, uh, we, marriage is something that there has to be laws about because uh, marriage is a civil matter. And once you have laws about it, then those laws are going to be influenced by the religious views of, uh, of the people, of the majority of the people. Uh, the same happens in your own country where, you know, the religious views or the lack of them uh, influence the, the laws on marriage. So, that, you know, that's an inevitable thing. Uh, and, but it could have been, uh, I think, that a, a much more uh, acceptable system would have been worked out had the line not been drawn between the two communities. In the north, you have, uh, you know, the Protestant and Puritanical uh, 
influence in law in, for example, matters like licensing laws, matters like uh, Sunday observance and uh, children's playgrounds on a Sunday locked up, this type of thing. But uh, I think that both suffered from the institutionalizing of the difference and the drawing of the line between them. Uh, well, well they, seem, they seem to suffer, I, I gather, um, substantially from an exaggeration of their, um, of their fears. Mm -hmm. And I take it that this is uh, regularly um, uh, stimulated by, by some of your, uh, your, your colleagues. A British historian wrote an interesting book years ago uh, in which he said that, in point of fact, the English made a dreadful mistake in the 18th century in permitting Patrick Henry to speak. His point being that Patrick Henry, for all that he is an American a hero, was by any objective standards um, a genuine uh, sort of war-promoting uh, uh, a demagogue, leaving aside your positions on Patrick Henry. Uh, I do wonder whether, uh, in a situation in which people are actually shooting each other, there is a justification for extending uh, uh, freedoms that, by everyone's agreement, ought to be enjoyed in stable societies, even to uh, eccentrics, to people who, uh, uh, whose words uh, actually do uh, incite uh, violence? Or have you given that theoretical point uh, any well, consideration? You, you're suggesting that, for example, we, we attempt to silence people like, say, Ian Paisley. Is that, that's really what you're I'm saying? Su well, I'm, suggesting that the, I'm suggesting that the argument exists. But I, 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 don't, I don't think so. I think, once no, myself. I think that what you must do, uh, and it's a very complex problem, and in this country it's an intensely emotional one, but I think what we must do is stand back from the problem and have a look at it and see you know, what is the basis of a solution and what sort of institutions can give expression to the conflicting aspirations in this country. And I think that that is what we have tried to do uh, in the recent settlement, in the sense that uh, we have two traditions in this country. And uh, for the past three centuries, their approach to, be, to one another has been approach of conflict. Uh, and uh, we have seen the results of that conflict. We've seen violence in practically every generation. And at the present time, we've seen over 947 graves in the north of Ireland to show that conflict is certainly not the way forward. And uh, if uh, we are going to pursue, uh, or either side is going to pursue, the attitude uh, of total victory for their particular uh, line, and indeed, uh, then we're going to end up once again with conflict. So the alternative to conflict is consensus or partnership. And what has been agreed has been that within the North itself, uh, there is to be a partnership form of administration between the different the elected representatives of different sections of the community uh, to administer uh, social and economic affairs in Northern Ireland. We used to call that United Front, didn't we? And, well, it's not quite a coalition because each retains its aspiration. The agreement to administer is confined purely to social and economic matters, but each side retains its basic aspiration. Now, in addition to that, there's a similar partnership uh, being built between North and South through the creation of a Council of Ireland, which will be a body that will have equality of representation between ministers North and South, uh, uh, between parliamentarians north and south, and we'll have a secretariat, and we'll have executive powers. In addition to that, which is a, a probably an even more important role than ex ex its executive role initially, it will have the power to harmonize uh, the laws, the structures, and the services north and south. In other words, to progressively plan the removal of difference. Uh, now, th those are the structures. They are structures which are based on consensus, not on conflict. They are structures which do not ask anyone to give up their basic aspirations uh, because any development uh, through those structures must be by agreement, which is obviously the best way forward for the people of this country. Well, I think, I think, uh, uh, I think it's, it's, it's so obvious, if I may say so, that it's, it's hardly worth dwelling on. Well, the, no, no, nobody in this room, I'm sure, or any room I've recently <coughs> been at, suggests that uh, Ireland would be better off than by proceeding with policies agreed to by all parties. But that, that isn't but what, th that isn't no, what brings I'm, us here. So, well, sorry, I'm not talking about party political policies. I'm talking about institutions of government. Yeah. Because the trouble in this country has been that institutions of government have not been accepted by substantial sections of the community. Mm. And we've got to try, and, 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 and there has been. On one side, there has been uh, the, the physical force Republican who wants to create 
uh, a 32 county independent republic, w no matter what the, 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 the Protestant in the North thinks. And on the other hand, there's the extreme loyalist who wants to maintain a Protestant ascendancy in the northern part of Ireland in a, a virtually an iron state. Now, while those two seek victory for their respective point of view, we are going to have a situation of continual conflict, which will periodically erupt into violence, death and destruction. Now, we either continue with that or we try to create institutions whereby these points of view can all be expressed peacefully. Now, l look at it, say, from the Republican point of view, uh, where a, a considerable amount of the violent activity has come. Uh, up till now, there were two basic obstacles in the way of achieving the unification of this country. One of them was the, was the British government's, the attitude of success of British governments. Uh, the other is the attitude of a majority of the people in the North. Now, following Sunningdale, the British government has made it absolutely clear. By doing what? In a declaration uh, as part of the Sunningdale Agreement. Oh, yeah. That in the event of a majority of people in Northern Ireland wanting Irish unity, it will support that. Mm -hmm never said that before. That means, in effect, that, that Britain is saying that the question of Irish unity is in fact a matter for <coughs> Irish people. Now, once that point is established, to my mind, it removes any possible justification for the use of physical force to achieve Irish unity because at that stage what we're talking about is uniting two sections of the Irish people, which cannot be justified by, by physical force because you can't unite people at the point of a gun. And therefore, what I am well, saying is... But as a matter of fact, you can. The, uh, you, you, well, can you, you can you achieve you it. Shouldn't, you shouldn't, but in, in point of fact, you, you can, and, and it's done uh, you know, fairly often. The North Vietnamese have been trying it and will probably succeed. Well, there is no doubt that, that, that there, is, you could, there is a possible situation in which violence could force Britain to simply wash her hands, walk out and say, right, sort it out between yourselves. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you could impose Irish unity on the situation. But will you have a peaceful situation? Will you have a solution? The question that the people of this country have to ask themselves, uh, particularly uh, in the extreme wing of the different traditions, is whether they want victory or whether they want a solution. Because there are two very different Well, things. I think there's some people who want a solution and some people who want victory. Isn't that? that that's, that's, why, uh, that's why I'm <coughs> extremely interested, especially with your um, academic experience, <coughs> united now to your practical experience, on whether there has been any evolution in your views about the extent to which uh, in, uh, in, in a highly technologized society with the extraordinary leverage that a terrorist can exercise, or, 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 or whether you can in fact indulge the kind of freedom exercised by, well, you mentioned Ian Paisley as an example. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, have, have you thought about that? Uh, Quite, quite apart from the fact that we all well, hope for I a peaceful solution. Well, I think that solution. if you have a society where you're going to deny the freedom of speech mm -hmm. uh, to people, I think that you have, you're admitting before you start that you have uh, an unstable society. But you certainly do have an unstable society. Well, I mean, of 947 course we have. 947 people is often Of course unstable. we have, yeah. but what we're talking about is creating new institutions which will produce stability. But you seem to be suggesting me that, to me that even within those, uh, in order to make sure that those institutions succeed, that we should, in fact, prevent people from expressing whatever they believe about them. Now, I, once I you do that, I think you're, you're, you're in the whole uh, realm of total repression of people's points of view. And once you do that, you, you're, only, well. you're only screwing down a lid that's going to blow off at a, blow off at a future date. That, that is, of course, the standard uh, argument. It is not, I think, one that has been uh, vindicated by the licentiousness of the century. I think, on the whole, probably, the world would have been better off if Hitler had been silenced <laughs> rather than, than listened to. And as you know, there's a thing called the Genocide Convention uh, in the United Nations, which is slowly working its way around, uh, which in fact uh, would make uh, it a crime against humanity to call for um, certain, to stimulate certain attitudes based on uh, genocidal impulses, racial or, or, or religious. Again, without uh, passing judgment on, on it, I do, I, do seem, I do feel that, that uh, North Ireland may be attempting too much when it attempts simultaneously to make progress uh, and to continue rigidly to defend the right of people like uh, uh, Ian Paisley and William Craig to, um, to um, uh, uh, stimulate passions and, uh, uh, and fears in the way that they do. Well, uh, I think 
th you know, th there's two, there's a distinction between people expressing their point of view uh, and even though that, that point of view is an expression of, of, of people's fears and even though it is an expression of prejudice, th there's a difference between that and open incitement uh, to... Uh, How close does he come? Well, I don't know. Uh, and, and I mean, it then becomes a matter of law. Uh, if, if there's a, if Would you have a law in North Ireland? Well, there is a law there. What does it the say? The incitement to hatred act, which prevents people, or is supposed to prevent people, uh, from um, to make it illegal to incite Has people to religious hatred. Under it? No, because it's it's just simply under an existing law. It's impossible to to prove uh, a case against anyone yeah. uh, on those grounds. When you wrote in 1971 that the British government quote should not fear to set in motion the movement towards the inevitable. You had what in mind? I had in mind uh, that, uh, that the unification of the country should come about by agreement, and that involved certain decisions of the British government. I the still believe taken. I still believe the unity of the country must come about by agreement, and I believe that uh, in order for that agreement to come about, uh, you have to create a situation in which the two sides work together so that the prejudices and fears which divide them can be steadily eroded. And out of that will come, of course, in my view, uh, a country, uh, a new Ireland, uh, which will be entirely different from the sort of United Ireland that the Protestant fears or that his extreme opponent wants to impose upon him. It will be something that will evolve by agreement. That is the best way forward. There are those who want it uh, instant at the, instantly at the point of a gun. Uh, of course, they may or may not succeed, but uh, they will not have produced, as I said before, they may have achieved victory for the point of view. They won't have achieved a solution to the Irish problem. As a, as a political matter, uh, is it uh, dangerous to you to uh, denounce uh, convincingly the activities of the IRA? Well, I do that. Uh, and uh, whether it's a dangerous matter or not, uh, I don't know. I didn't mean uh, physically, I meant yeah. politically. Uh, well. Uh, I don't approve at all of their their violence, never have done, uh, and I, I have repeatedly and on many occasions uh, uh, disapproved of it publicly and uh, opposed it. And uh, obviously there is a, a section of the community that, that has given them support in the past, but I think that that is very small today because of the continuation of their campaign beyond the point which people would have regarded that, that they had any justification for at all. Uh, would you back uh, uh, legislation of a kind that would uh, heighten the, uh, the search and the apprehension and the conviction of uh, IRA agents? I think that, uh, you know, that if one approaches a solution to this problem on the basis of a repressive attitude, mm -hmm. uh, that one will not solve it. That because uh, one has to deal with the realities of life in Ireland. But you solve one the problem then, don't you? you? You don't actually. You only put them aside for a while. Uh, and you've got to create, it comes down to creating institutions of government that give free expression to all aspirations and points of view. No, no, we it comes down to that, and you've got to do that and have a normal process of law within that. Well, sure, that's obviously desirable, but for instance, uh, we had a thing called the Ku Klux Klan, yes. and for a great many years the Ku Klux Klan was uh, more or less ritualistically denounced mm -hmm. by southern uh, politicians, but in fact, so powerful with the Ku Klux Klan that whenever uh, it was suggested that uh, legislative uh, uh, remedies uh, might be used so as to track them down, uh, mm -hmm. counter penetration, all that kind of stuff, um, somehow the laws never got passed. And it was obvious why they didn't get passed because Southern politicians were afraid that their careers would be adversely affected. I'm wondering whether there is that counterpart that protects the IRA in your country. Well, well there is to, to, to the extent that uh, one of the reasons why uh, violence has been able to gain such strength in the northern part of Ireland is that a substantial section of the community, as I said earlier, withdrew its consent from the system of government and in particular from the forces of law and order, mm -hmm. which were seen as an instrument of one-party rule. Yeah. That, was, that is fundamental and that is still fundamental to a solution in that we have to create a system of security and policing with, to which people will give their consent. And once that is created, once you have a police service to which people support from all sections, then you have an entirely different situation in applying the normal rule of law to a violent situation. Because what's happening at the minute is that people, because they do not have confidence in the forces of law and order, 
uh, do not cooperate with them. Well, do, do and th that must change uh, completely if we are to create a stable situation. Uh, is, is it then correct for me to say that you are predicting the uh, end of the IRA by attrition as the result of the fact that you now have a government in which both sides participate? No, I am predicting the fact that we have a set of institutions in which both sides in the north and north and south are participating, thereby giving it the consent of both sections of the community in the north and both parts of Ireland, number one, and secondly, that we will develop a system of law and order that will also have the consent. And it's, uh, the, the whole question of law and order, of course, is at the heart of the And at of that point, solution. IRA will be isolated. Uh, I would hope that rather than be isolated, that the point of view that they represent would participate in the political processes uh, and that they would be clearly seen by everyone not to be the slightest justification for the violent expression of any point of view. Yeah, but we, we, we hear it said in America, is this incorrect, that uh, much of the IRA uh, is in fact dominated by people who have no interest whatever in the kind of uh, stability that you describe, that it is revolutionary uh, not uh, out of <coughs> necessity but out of preference and that under the circumstances you would face uh, that distinct problem irrespective of whether you develop a uh, eudaimonic uh, society, uh, uh, perfect reason and justice. Is, is, is this an exaggeration? Or is this in part true? Well, if it is true, uh, and it remains to be seen whether it is or not, if it is true, then w how that simply would have to be dealt with uh, is that in a situation, as I say, where we have institutions that people respect and uh, support, and where we have a system of law and order that people respect and support, then anybody who breaks the law uh, is dealt with uh, in the normal process and by the normal processes of the law. Uh, and uh, that would be how I would see it developing. Do you predict that you will have an effective extradition arrangement with uh, Ireland? I don't respecting think Respecting each other's uh, I don't think. I don't think that there will be uh, an extradition arrangement as such. Uh, I don't think that extradition, uh, extradition goes much deeper than the particular political problem between North and South and that it's an international arrangement. I think that uh, there are attempts being made at the present point of time to develop a common law enforcement area between both parts of Ireland. Uh, violence in Ireland cannot be separated by the border. Uh, neither can policing, uh, and neither can the law really in relation to these matters. And all of these matters must be considered basically in an all-Ireland context uh, and in order to produce a, a stability. And do you think this Council of Ireland uh, uh, argues for an acceleration of that uh, development? I do, yes. Uh -huh. Mr. Vincent Brown is with the Evening Herald, Mr. Brown. Um, <coughs> the Sangel Agreement really hinges on the acceptance by a large proportion Would you of mind identifying the Sunningdale uh, Agreement? I'm sorry, the ag agreement which provides for a power-sharing executive in Northern Ireland and the Council of Ireland for the whole of Ireland. Uh, it provides for, uh, it, rather, it is, it is conditional on the acceptance of this agreement uh, on, um, by a large section of the people of Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Now, among the people you represent, I'm wondering if they are going to accept it so <coughs> readily, for you gave specific guarantees prior to the Assembly elections, mm -hmm. which on the face of it uh, appear to have been breached by the agreement. In the first place, you said that the police force in Northern Ireland, the RUC, would have to be scrapped entirely and replaced either by a joint police force controlled by, or rather a police force controlled jointly by Dublin and London, or a police force under the control of the Council of Ireland. And this hasn't happened, though there is very indirect influence by the Council of Ireland over the police force now. Secondly, you said that the Council of Ireland would have to have built into it an inexorable process towards a united Ireland within a fixed timescale, and this hasn't happened. And thirdly, you said that internment would have to end before you'd take part in, the, in any executive that uh, would emerge. And internment hasn't ended, and you've taken part now. In the light of these breaches uh, of faith with the, uh, your electorate in Northern Ireland, I'm wondering to what extent you can get them to accept the agreement. Well, in the first place, I would question your three presumptions. Uh, we did not at any stage say that we would not take part in an executive unless internment was ended first. We did not at any stage say that. Seven I'll deal with each point. Uh, secondly, on the policing question, I'll go into that in detail. On the, uh, I'll deal with the internment question first. Uh, we have opposed internment from the very beginning. 
there was a stage uh, when we said we wouldn't engage in talks. Excuse me, we as you or you uh, and the your party? The SDLP, the party yeah. that I represent, where we would not engage in talks while internment lasted. And of course, uh, at the time of direct rule, which you referred to earlier, the British uh, removed Stormont and promised to phase out internment. Between March and July of that year, the internment figures dropped from 956 to 241. I think clear evidence that it was phasing out, although phasing out is not satisfactory. We want a complete clearing out. But there was a truce at that stage uh, in which uh, uh, there was a commitment to end internment. Now that truce was broken, not by ourselves. And following that, it was clear to us that we either had to use the normal political processes altogether or remain on the sidelines uh, and break your word out of it altogether. But so we simply uh, engaged in discussions. And we see no other way forward out of this problem other than by political discussion. And there's no other way to bring internment to an end by discussion. But there are people, just a second, there are people who are trying to bomb their way out of internment and shoot their way out of internment. They're not succeeding. They're only succeeding in having more people interned. And also, um, in my view, if the violence was ended tomorrow, it would increase the political pressure for the ending of internment. We are committed to its ending. We have received, in paragraph 18 of the Sunning Deal Agreement, a commitment from the British government to phase it out again. Uh, we expect that commitment to be delivered. Is there a yes, time limit? There, there isn't a time limit on but it. Quite apart from, uh, quite apart from uh, what you, you, you asked now about think, policing, well, yeah. can, I, can I just deal yeah. with the issue you've drawn? Quite apart from what you now think is politically necessary, the fact is that at one stage you gave a specific commitment in the first place that you would not talk to the British government prior to the ending of internment, and you talked before internment ended for whatever reasons, and they might have been valid reasons, but yeah. it involved your breach of faith. And secondly, you, uh, you successive um, candidates for your party in the last assembly election said there would be no executive until internment ended, and there has been an executive until internment ended. Now, I'm not arguing about whether this is right or not. I'm <coughs> just asking you that having broken faith twice on the issue of internment and on the other two issues, can you take the captive population with well, you? Well, in the first place, I don't have the slightest doubt that we have the support of the vast majority of the Catholic community. But then why Secondly, didn't you say to them in the election? Why didn't you just say just in the election no, that you would agree all, to... In the election, and you know, we're getting down into detail now, which a lot of the viewers probably will not understand, but before the election took place, we explained our position clearly on internment and talks and put it to the people. And for the first time, in 50 years, and for the first time since Northern Ireland was created, you had one party elected representing one tra that, that particular tradition, and all the little splinters, and all the people who take the view that you are questioning about relating to internment were wiped out of the election, so we got the mandate to do it. No, that's now, not so. That's not so. We did well, not seek a mandate, yeah. and never sought a mandate, and I say never. Uh, we never said in our, in our manifesto or at any stage in the election campaign that we would not participate in a new system of government while internment ended, but we did say that it, we could not see a new system of government existing alongside the continuation of internment, and we have consistently fought to bring it to an end, and we are, we are confident that we will succeed in that objective in spite of those who maintain internment at the moment or maintain the reason and excuse for it by their violence. Ms. Nell McCafferty is with the Irish Times. <coughs> yeah, uh, Mr. Hume, I must come back to, to the issue of internment, which is rankling sore in the Irish community. We have internment camps here, which are the only ones in Western Europe. Two years ago, you, called on the, you asked the people of Northern Ireland, who supported you politically, mm -hmm. to embark on a rent and rates strike in the country, mm -hmm. uh, which would be ended, you said then, when the last internee was released. You took this stand, one must presume, because you consider internment of itself to be totally wrong, that it is not, internment is not justified by any events happening in that country. We have now called for the rent and rate strike to be called off, and you have reneged on your wishes at the time when you said that people wouldn't have to pay arrears either in rent or rates, you're now saying they should, and no undue hardship should be inflicted on them as a result, implying that due hardship should be inflicted on them as a result of carrying out your wishes. <laughs> Having called off the rent and rate strike, Mr. Hume, are you now saying that internment is in fact justified because of provisional violence? Are you in fact saying that internment caused violence 
and reneging from your previous position that violence caused internment and <coughs> internment of itself is totally no, wrong. You did say, and I will recall we'll, your we'll, words, uh, we will call off this campaign when, when the last yes, internee yes, has right. been released. That's there are still internees. Is, there are now a thousand You're quite them. correct. You're talking about a situation which existed in 1971. Internment. And when we said that we were withdrawing our consent from the system of government for two reasons to end the existing system and to end internment. We achieved half of that. Now, the point I want to make is this, is internment is a serious problem in Northern Ireland. We recognize that, but it's one of many. And we've got to look at the overall situation. We can stand outside everything until every internee is released, which means in effect that we are asking the men of violence to take over completely. Now that's what it means whether we like it or not. And remember, there is execution without trial in Northern Ireland, and that's far worse yes. than imprisonment without trial. Perpetrated by the British Army in their own constituency two years ago. If people who are concerned about internment, and I believe that we are the only party in this country that's deeply concerned about it, because we're the only party who are taking the proper means to bring it about. How many of your members are interned, Mr. Kim? Are you the what, only one who cares? What other party in this country has ever succeeded uh, uh, in the present internment thing? What other party or grouping has succeeded? in obtaining the release of a single internee, not one. But we have to say, and it must be underlined, that in the present political situation, with uh, the bombing and shooting going on, that is providing the justification for the British government of maintaining internment. Everybody knows that. If that were to stop, then massive political pressure could be exerted on them to bring it to an end. Everybody knows that to be the Are position. You internment Yet those who oppose internment accept ourselves who also oppose it, don't ever turn to the other people who can bring internment to an end and put the pressure on them, those other people being quite bluntly the provisional IRA. But Mr. Hewan, the provisional IRA were in existence when you made your declaration and commitments on internment, it's, it's bombing and shootings were, <coughs> uh, were continuing then and there was execution without trial. That nothing has changed in relation I to that. But in I that context, uh, in August 71, you made specific <coughs> commitments which you have now yes, reneged on. You know, uh, this brings us down to what political change is all about, or what movement for political change is all about. Is it about, uh, you know, is it about improving the way of life of people? Is it about giving people a say in their own future and in the administration of their own country uh, so that uh, the, the wealth of the country can be better distributed so that they can have homes and have jobs? Is that what it's about? Or is it about fighting for some peculiar uh, concept uh, <coughs> But why didn't you that, think that of that in relate. when you made your we commitments? We didn't think to it. We have consistently yeah. argued that what we are about, as opposed to other people, what we are about is improving the way of life of yeah. people in the north of Ireland who have been deprived. And we think that what we, the system of government that we have now gives those people an opportunity through their elected representatives to improve their way of life. I'd like to uh, intervene here, if I may, to say that uh, uh, I gather this is a very hot issue here. It is, oh, but, yes. Uh, it's, a very it, hot it, issue. it's also true that... Um, Every North Vietnamese politician, every American politician, every South Vietnamese politician said that they would not meet across a conference table unless A, B, or, or, or C. And they said this time and time and time again. And neither side yielded. And in due course, uh, both sides retreated a little bit from their pre-stipulations. And, and uh, everybody inside got the Nobel Prize. Uh, I, we didn't really get a, get a hell of a lot of peace. We got our, yeah. we got our prisoners back and so on and so forth. And presumably, I don't, I don't see why we have to go over the ground, because it seems to me that uh, whether he's you know, whether uh, uh, Mr. Hume is right or wrong, what he is saying is, I did the best I could. And <coughs> the situation is not analogous. The Mr. Uh, President Nixon, or nobody in North Vietnam, fought an election solely on the basis of specific commitments related to well, negotiations. I, oh, sorry, I, I, have, I am saying to you, did, and they I am have saying to you, Vincent, that what you are saying about the election that we fought in the month of June and specific commitments, I am saying to you, you are wrong. I concede to you, and I readily concede, and I don't attempt to deny it, that previous to the election, uh, we had well, John, I think from this talking is just while internment really. lasts. It's it, not semantic. It is really. Had I'm you quite said prepared to, the to concede and admit time. that there was a time when we refused to talk while internment lasted. But I also say that in that election we explained our position and we made no such commitments. Yeah. And you can check it up. It's this on the record. Mr. Kevin Myers from the, is the Belfast uh, correspondent of the Observer. Uh, Mr. Hume, on the same point of internment, I'd like to just take it up from a different tack. Um, you know, and I know, that there are a number of people in uh, Long Cash internment camp who are better off for the community inside there. We'll take for an example 
I think you know and I know that the Army have reason to believe that the killer of one of your colleagues, Senator Paddy Wilson, is in Long Cash. Now, wouldn't you rather see that man interned than be allowed out to make the random killings that... How are the libel laws in Ireland? Uh, flexible, well, of I course, hope, he, he hasn't named the man, but you see, this is the sort are we of thing, supposed to know who he this is? This is the sort of point of view we get put about internment in an attempt to justify its continuing existence. That, in fact, there are people in there who have murdered people. Well, you know, uh, if you're going to give this sort of arbitrary power to politicians to intern people, then I, I think that we cannot accept as an argument you know, uh, there are people in who have committed these specific crimes because if they have and if they know they've committed them, they then we should bring them to court that wasn't with the, the evidence. Question, uh, you know, Kevin, you know, to be fair about it. That wasn't the question, though. Um, my question was what does one do about people like killers, we, sectarian killers, random yeah. killers? Well, well, what one does about Northern Ireland, you see, one can pick the symptoms of the disease, which is really what we've <coughs> been talking about for the last 10 minutes. Internment is a symptom of the disease which has been Northern Ireland. So, so is violence. The is there, got so is violence. So is uh, sectarianism. These are all symptoms. The, the real disease is that it is a divided society. Now we either apply ourselves to the symptoms, uh, and we can do that, as many people are doing. You don't solve the problem. You only postpone a solution to it, and these symptoms come up again. Or you attack the root of the problem, <coughs> which is that it is a divided society. Now I would submit that in our recent discussions and negotiations following the election and in the Sunning Deal Agreement, that's what we have done. We have attacked the root, which is it's a divided society, and built institutions whereby the two sections of this divided society can work together by agreement uh, uh, and without sacrificing their basic aspirations. It's, it's a long-term solution. It is. It, well, it could be a long-term yeah. solution. Whether it is one or not, will, time will show. But in the short term, you have this problem of violence. And there's no sign that violence is going to abate. It's continuing. It continued today, it continued yesterday, and it will continue tomorrow. Now, how does one deal with it? How one deals with that, in my view, is that one ensures that the police and security services uh, that, that serve the people are acceptable to, the, to both sections of the community as part of the settlement. That is in process of being worked out at the minute following the Sunning Deal Agreement. When you have that done, and even before you have that done, I am of the opinion that the internment camp should be cleared out completely. I am not in favour of phasing out. I am in favour of completely clearing them because of the political history of the question, particularly because of the nature of it and the way it has been used in the past, clearing it out and then seeking participation in the political institutions. If at that point of time people decide to overthrow the institutions once again, by violence, then they've got to be faced up to squarely and the institutions which have been democratically created, remember, defended. One of these sources you outlined for the um, outbreak of provisional IRA violence was the fact that Stormont did not, the old Stormont government and the old Unionist government did not have, as you say, the support Consent, of a, yes. a substantial section of the community mm -hmm. and no government can continue in the face of the withdrawal of such consent. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't this true now for a large section of the Protestant population, the right-wing loyalist representatives? Now, they number 29 or so, 27 to 29 members in the assembly, approximately one-third of the assembly. That's the same proportion as the Catholic proportion in Stormont. Now, they feel themselves to be excluded from the processes of government. Their representatives are not invited to Sunningdale, where the final treaty for Northern Ireland was hammered out. Well, they were not allowed to attend. And you, the leader of your party, Jerry Fitt, on television, agreed that they should not be allowed to attend. Well, now, uh, surely you know, this feeling of powerlessness, which was once felt by the Catholics, has been felt by Protestants, and the consent has been withdrawn. Well, there's two points I'd make there. First of all, do not distort the truth. Uh, they were not excluded from the discussions leading to Sunningdale or Sunningdale itself. They excluded themselves. They refused to go. I mean, that is a fact of life. Paisley, Craig and company refused to enter the discussion. They did not refuse to go they to Sunningdale. The they, they wanted to be in on the negotiations. But the whole process which ended up in Sunningdale began in, on the 5th of October in Belfast. The first stage of Sunningdale was the creation of, of, of a power-sharing executive in Northern Ireland. They excluded themselves from that. Part of the condition of the creation of the power-sharing executive, which we insisted upon, was the creation of... Uh, 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 of a Council of Ireland. It logically followed from that that there had to be a Sunningdale. They excluded themselves from that whole process, but 
Uh, to get on to the basic point you're making, the fact that they've withdrawn consent, first of all, I believe that that, 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 that section of the community uh, does and is at the moment in a bewildered and confused state. I don't think there's any doubt about that because within a very short time they've had stripped away uh, what they believe to be their basic protection, uh, they, their own parliament uh, and everything that went with it. Uh, and they believe that that's suddenly been taken away. I think that what they're going to find is that those leaders who are at present withdrawing on their behalf have been misleading them in the sense that they will find that in effect the other section of the community that was the basis of their political attitudes in the past, in other words, their, their hatred of them, that they will find that, they will, that, that, that the roof will not fall in on top of them, that in fact there will be fair play uh, and the major responsibility, in fact, I think, for breaking down the, the strong sectarian feelings that exists among the section of the community you're talking about now rests with ourselves, uh, who for the first time represent a particular section of the community, mainly the minority, in government then a particular responsibility rests upon us to demonstrate clearly that our attitudes are totally non-sectarian and we can do that in practice and in the way that we <coughs> administer. Now, that, 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 that is the first point I would make in dealing with them. With I think you make, you've made a good prudential point, but uh, 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 surely you can make uh, an additional uh, point to answer Mr. Meyer's objection. As I understand that uh, a, a, a society not only uh, can't but shouldn't uh, accommodate uh, a minority uh, whose uh, uh, explicit uh, intention is uh, to make uh, uh, a working uh, society uh, impossible. Well, uh, no, uh, if, I, if I you, think there, there, there is another point here. If you mutiny, uh, then uh, you can't possibly uh, represent the mutinous uh, yeah. aspects in any sense we give them well, satisfaction. Uh, uh, Mr. Unless Mr. every tenth day you shoot somebody. Well, Mr. Myers made the point to, to say that... Equally. Mr. Myers made the point that the, the withdrawal of the loyalist uh, in Northern Ireland at the minute, which is the extreme Protestant, is analogous to the withdrawal of the, the uh, Catholic population or the nationalist population. Well, it's not quite analogous in that, you know, the, 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 the nationalist tradition in the North is, was a, a homogeneous community uh, and more or less one, whereas, the, if you like, the British-oriented orient, community in the North, the loyalist community, uh, a large section of it is in fact supporting the institutions now, there's nowhere where you can specifically draw the line and say, well, that section uh, has got a complete identity of its own. The, 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 the section which I represent has an identity of its own, uh, but there is this dividing line, and there are people crossing it from day to day, as you know. Uh, some people who would originally support Paisley who are uh, per, uh, completely <coughs> disillusioned by uh, his recent antics and her moving away from him. So there's not that clear-cut uh, analogy that, that, that you said there is, and I think you would probably accept that. There I would it? accept well, that. Excuse me, John, you said two years ago when 13 of your constituents were murdered in Derry by the British Army, mm -hmm. you declared then it's a united Ireland now or nothing. Mm -hmm. Do you see the Sunningdale Agreement as the first step or any step on the road to United Ireland by consent or otherwise, and thus see it in uh, this interpretation thus be a direct conflict <coughs> of your unionist leader, Brian Faulkner, who says that it solidifies the British link? Or do you, in fact, no longer see Sunningdale as a step on the road to United Ireland? And your words then were just so much uh, emotional claptrap. Well, Nell, if you're appearing in here as a journalist, then your statement... I'm appearing here, John, as one of your, your constituents. Your, your statement should be objective. It is objective. And you should not talk of Brian Faulkner as my leader in the way that you do in order to make he a comment. He is your leader, comment. John. He is not my leader. Uh, I that, thought he was that the chief is a deliberate, a deliberate misinterpretation of what has happened in Northern Ireland. Because what has happened in Northern Ireland is there has been an agreement between agreed different political parties. He is to the agreed leader. Let him job. Let, let me finish. Say, yeah. If I make a, agree, if you make an agreement to build a house for me, we have agreed to build a house. We haven't agreed to do any more than that. What what we have agreed with the Unionist Party in Northern Ireland is to administer. Northern Ireland according to an agreed social and economic program mm. for four years. It does not mean that we accept or surrender one another's aspirations. Uh, let that be very clear. Now, you ask me, uh, does the Sunningdale Agreement lead to a united Ireland? My answer is that I hope it will. I think it creates the circumstances in which there can be free expression of the aspiration uh, towards a united Ireland and in which it can be achieved by agreement. It also allows 
the unionist population to freely express theirs and to prevent it happening if they don't want to. But I happen to believe that the real division that exists in Ireland is not a line on the map, it is a mental division between both sections of the community. It is prejudice and it is distrust. And you remove that division by people working together and realizing that all that they were told about the other section of the community simply wasn't true. And I believe that those institutions allow for that sort of working together. Um, formerly, um, the orthodox nationalist uh, position was that Northern Ireland was an illegal entity, uh, an unjust entity, and that as such, the majority within Northern Ireland didn't have the usual rights of a majority, and that a united Ireland should be brought about by peaceful means, but not necessarily with the consent of this illegal uh, and improper majority in Northern Ireland. Now, at the start of your political career, you seem to be in that mold, and you seem to be expressing this view after the massacre of Bloody Sunday, when you said it's now a united Ireland or nothing. Now, I always accept that you wanted a united Ireland by peaceful means, but is it not true to say that at one stage you wanted it by without the agreement without the agreement of the majority in the north and now you're insisting on the agreement and thereby giving legitimacy no, to the I, I think if you case. examine the, 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 the manifestos and documents that uh, our party has always produced and indeed that uh, any time I've spoken about it you will always find that uh, unity by agreement is written right into it always has been you mentioned a particular quotation. In fact, again, you, you should quote <coughs> accurately. Uh, 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 in that particular sense, uh, I was talking about, and the question I was asked about was the mood of the people. And I described the mood, and I think uh, everybody would agree I described it very accurately. But in, in terms, if you're going to unite, if you look at the Irish problem, and one must look at, not in a doctrinaire sense of saying the solution to the Irish problem is the removal of Britain. It's not more than the removal of Britain is required. Agreement between two sections of the community, because it's, it's the two sections who are at one another's throat. Yes, and absolutely. therefore, the only unity that is going to mean peace, a solution, yeah. and not a victory, as I said, is a unity by agreement. Oh, and one so. must create the institutions and the conditions in which that agreement can come about freely. I think we have done that. Yeah, but let, let me just ask you this, uh, because uh, the question Mr. Brown asked, uh, is one I've heard before. <coughs> you used to take, or if not you, uh, uh, people with whom you associated, a historical position, the burden of which was that it was illegitimately expected of a majority of the Protestants in North Ireland <coughs> that they should need to acquiesce for unity, but that now, thanks to the White Paper and the Sunningdale Agreement, you have edged over into the retroactive legitimization of that partition, such that you do require a plebiscite which would give a majority of the Protestants veto power over unity. No, I think that, uh, that, that, I mean, the argument that you're putting about the illegitimacy of the northern state is an argument that applies to the, to the previous situation. Uh, there's not an entirely new situation in Northern Ireland. There is no longer one party rule. There is partnership uh, between not between my part, party uh, and the Unionist Party, uh, although that's <coughs> an existing partnership, but there is a formula for partnership built into the new constitution uh, in Northern Ireland, whereby the elected representatives of different sections will combine to administer. There is also a partnership between North and South. There is, if you like, a bridge across the border. Now, this is an entirely new situation. And realistically, to come back to it again, if one stands back and says, right, here is a conflict, we know what the conflict has produced. It has produced death and destruction. Let's, instead of conflict, Absolutely let's have government. consensus. Thank you, and Mr. that's Newman. what we've got today, and it will bring lasting peace in this country, I hope. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, members of the panel.
Next week on Firing Line, Dr. Noel Brown joins Mr. Buckley for an exchange of ideas on Catholicism and socialism in Ireland. For a printed bound copy of this program, send 25 cents in coin to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. That's 25 cents to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. This program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.